Friends with Benefits, The Pyramid Scheme Why Patron-Client Networks Maintain Power in Poor Democracies Part 1 Preamble and Rambling Hi everyone, so I'm trying out adding podcasts to my content mix to complement the more short-form animated videos I've been doing. I think it will be good to be able to dive into topics a bit more in depth and maybe take a little more time to go over concepts at a slightly slower pace. I am still going to keep doing the animated videos, but I'm going to try and focus them more on concepts which benefit more strongly from being accompanied by visual aids, illustrating diagrams, timelines and trade patterns for example. Then, the more in-depth concepts and more nuanced critiques which have less obvious visual illustrations and benefit from being explained at greater length will go into podcasts. At least that's the plan for now. I'll get into a bit more detail about where I'm going with this channel at the end of the video. So to start this new format, I'm going to begin with an episode looking at a paper by Mushta Khan about the differences in the ways in which democracies work in wealthier and poorer countries. Part 2 Mushta Khan's World View This links to an earlier video I've done about corruption in poorer countries and its effect on development, which also drew heavily on Mushta Khan's work. I'll put a link in the description below on YouTube. Not sure what to do on other platforms yet, if I do upload this to other podcast platforms. Before we get started on the specifics of the article for today on patron client networks in poor country democracies, I'm just briefly going to summarize where I think Mushra Khan is coming from. Khan believes that capitalist development, driven by a dirigious developmental state, that is one which intervenes a lot in the economy, is the most desirable option for developing countries to follow. However, he does view capitalist development in a much less rosy light than other capitalist progressives, rather than glossing over the inequality, dispossession and primitive accumulation, or arguing that more egalitarian benign forms of capitalist development are always possible. He also acknowledges many of the issues with developed liberal capitalist democracies, and the way in which economic power in these countries shapes the struggle for socio-economic rights which take place in them. This does not mean that he accepts all forms of capitalist development as equally beneficial or equally brutal, and that it is not worth attempting to follow less destructive models of accumulation. Rather, he argues that all capitalist development must depend on accumulation of sufficient wealth to a newly forming bourgeoisie, and enough concentration to ensure economies of scale, and that models which do not allow for this are unrealistic ideals of capitalist development. He argues that not all forms of corruption hamper development, and that some can actually be essential for early accumulation and financing productivity boosting investment. In terms of the corruption which does actually damage growth, he argues that liberal anti-corruption measures, such as increased transparency and regulation, are often costly, ineffective and damage the developmental capacity of the state to correct market failures and build competitive, high value added industries. Instead, he suggests that corruption in developing countries is often caused by the small size of the modern capitalist sector, and that a large modern capitalist sector is often the most effective group in society at reducing many forms of corruption which reduce their own productivity. He argues that the anti-capitalist left and movements centered around the poorest sectors of society are too weak in most countries to offer an effective power block capable of successfully pushing the state to reduce corruption and establish rule of law. One final idea of his I want to address before moving on to the main article is his view of property rights. For him, property rights are not something natural, nor is it common for states, even liberal ones, to actually enforce all property rights. Rather, 
Systems of property rights must generate enough surplus in order to pay for their own continual protection. And there is little hope for systems of property rights which do not support a productive system capable of producing this surplus, which it deems as non-viable. This contradicts common liberal notions that the property rights they are founded on are stable, natural, justly earned or gained, and as a result, uncontestable, both politically and morally. It also contradicts with many thinkers further on the left, which view the protection of pre-capitalist property rights as a vital struggle for welfare, environmental sustainability, and social and economic justice. For example, in the case of land rights for peasant subsistence agriculture. These ideas form the basis of Kant's understanding of political economy of developing countries, and it is with these ideas in mind that we can begin to understand his interpretations of the interests and forces at play within democracies in developing countries. Part 3. Democracies in Developed Countries In order to understand Kant's models of democracies in developing countries, it is important to understand what he is comparing them to. Firstly, because many of our current understandings about how democracies are supposed to act is based on our understanding of developed countries, with democracies in developing countries being viewed as failed imitations. Secondly, it is important because his understanding of these wealthy democracies differs substantially from more liberal understandings of them. For Khan, wealthy democracies are characterized by a large capitalist sector, which the vast majority depends on for their livelihood, either directly or through tax revenue, and therefore the range of politics is narrowly constrained to be what is viewed as viable for this capitalist sector, even though it does occasionally end up in crisis. Further, the state has significant capacity both to spend and to regulate the economy. Changes to these policies affect a wide group of people, and so large coalitions form around common interests. Lobbying and influence happens more at the level of policy formation rather than at the level of implementation, and implementation is largely carried out professionally. Although there are scandals and abuses, these can often be addressed and policy for greater transparency and increased political competition can effectively reduce them because there are no fundamental structural reasons for them and powerful interest groups do want to eliminate them. I want to highlight the difference between contested policy formation and policy implementation. In wealthy democracies, it is often accepted that wealthy interests will have a disproportionate decision in setting the policy agenda. For example, they may push through controversial infrastructure projects. However, they will most likely not interfere with the actual implementation of these projects as often. For example, vying over government contracts and then vastly cutting corners on the fulfillment of the contracts. This does still happen, but it doesn't dominate the political process because other policy room is often more important. Another example would be that comprehensive environmental legislation may be more difficult to pass in developed countries with a wealthy capitalist sector. But in developing countries, more comprehensive environmental regulation may pass, but then fail to be implemented. Officials responsible for enforcement are bribed away from true regulation. Democracies in Developing Countries Khan argues that while democracy is obviously desirable on its own ground, there is little evidence that, that either democratic or authoritarian regimes have distinct advantages in economic development. This is a point for democracy against authoritarian modernization theories. Going on a bit of a tangent about the evidence on democracies and growth, certainly there are more wealthy Blanc democratic McCormick. countries and many poor authoritarian ones. But he argues that there is no direct causal mechanism. So democracy does not drive development, and economic development does not inevitably set in motion forces 
which lead to democratization. Instead, he suggests that this pattern emerges because wealthy countries that do transition to democracies have a better chance of remaining that way once the transition happens. Back to the main argument. Mushtaq then suggests that instead of a general link, one should look at specific accumulative regimes which form within countries, and that the different types of accumulative regimes can form in both democracies and authoritarian regimes. And it is these which determine whether or not growth occurs. For a collection of reasons I will explore, both democratic and authoritarian politics in many developing countries are dominated by patron-client networks. What are patron-client networks? They are friends with benefits, i.e. a hierarchy of personal connections where the patron offers payoffs to clients for political support and they in turn do the same in a pyramid, each layer being clients of the layer above and patrons to the layer below, and with smaller and smaller payoffs further down. Payoffs are funded either by direct control over state assets and contracts by the head of the network, or by concessions gained from the ruling coalition if the patron-client network is not in power. Khan argues that most ruling patron-client networks in developed countries have very little to do with traditional legitimization, and instead are the result of economic conditions. It is not that people have a culture of deference to big men, or feel an ongoing debt to struggle leaders and therefore have a blind spot to their corruption. So what conditions lead to this in developing countries? as compared with wealthy countries. For starters, the nature of the economy is very different. The modern capitalist sector is less developed, and many people do not directly rely on it, instead relying on subsistence and petty commodity production outside of the modern sector, so that the ruling party's policy is not constrained to ensure the viability of growth of the capitalist sector in the same capacity. Secondly, there is very little revenue by the state, and also little regulatory capacity, so broader coalitions cannot meaningfully form around policy regarding either of these. Instead, the main policies that can be controlled by parties are the direct control over state assets and contracts. Finally, organising is a major constraint in developing countries, especially poor ones and patron-client networks tend to be easier to organise than broader coalitions. The difference between authoritarian and democratic regimes in developing countries depends on who these networks are formed by and how large they need to be, and which groups end up included or excluded. Although these factions often use rhetoric around broader issues, be it class, region or political ideology, no one takes this particularly seriously. These coalitions can be fragile, but not because there is a risk of revolt, which is often not possible given that no other form of political organisation is viable or perceived to be viable. Instead, they are worried that if they fail to capture enough surplus to ensure the loyalty of the entire network, that some faction of their network may break away and they will then be replaced by another patron-client network. Finally, we can return to the idea of viable property rights, and note that many property rights in developing countries are not viable according to Khan. They do not generate enough surplus to pay for their own protection, and so, and so are vulnerable to predation or expropriation by the ruling coalition. Conclusion so what is there to take away from this? 1. Democratization is not linked to development. 2. Authoritarianism is not linked to development. 3. Building a political regime capable of supporting capitalist accumulation and development in poor countries is tricky and requires analysing the specificities of the country rather than relying on universal policy prescriptions, such as a good government's framework.
There are a number of other interesting points in this article, which I may discuss at another time. Mostly, the way it links back to critiques of neo-Weberian theories of democracy in the state, as well as critiques of modernization theory. There are also other articles using this analysis to explore actual case studies, which may make it easier to understand. I also think it would be interesting to explore how these are affected by international forces and capital in more depth, but I'll leave that for another time. End notes. Where to from here? At the moment, given the current public awareness on heterodox and pluralist ideas in economics, I'm mostly going to simply focus on explaining some ideas I see as important, rather than really trying to synthesize them on a deep level with each other. My view on pluralism is evolving, and probably requires further reading into the philosophy and history of science and social quote-unquote science, to develop more fully. At the moment, I would say I view pluralism as pragmatic at this point, given the state of economics, rather than being a virtue in and of itself. I think that synthesizing insights and findings from different schools of thought in economics is very important. But a very time-consuming project, and that trying to synthesize a unified heterodox economics theory constantly can be less useful or time efficient than learning and doing research on the schools of on different schools' ideas in partial isolation, acknowledging where they differ, but not always rigorously attempting to reconcile them every time one stumbles upon a difference. I also think that as much as research develops over time, with dialogue and contributions from a wide variety of authors, which gradually narrow down and clarify ideas over time, so too attempts to convert primary research into pedagogy, i.e. finding ways to teach academic concepts, may must also evolve and develop, and although there is already a fair amount of attempts at heterodox pedagogy, it is much smaller and less evolved than mainstream economics pedagogy, or pedagogy in other disciplines. Thus, my aim is rather to produce more of an open rough draft of what a pedagogy of some of these concepts might look like, rather than necessarily being the most thorough, thought out way to create a heterodox pedagogy. Please do like and subscribe if you found this interesting. And check out my other videos, especially the one on corruption and developmental states, which directly relates back to this one.